Hi, um, this is another video or um, you know PowerPoint with with audio trying to clarify some points from the reading. And um, what I would suggest you guys pay attention to, um, there's actually subtitled sections in the reading for school access, quality of education, curricular policies, and patterns of school performance. And each of those areas um, has like a few key points that are important to know. And then um, what I'll do is I'll introduce you guys and give you some context, like on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, we'll talk a little bit about additive and subtractive schooling. Um, and then again, some of the policy concerns. Uh, I always like to begin uh, you know, this um, sort of topic by differentiating, talking about um, Latino versus um, Hispanic and some of the terminology. And um, the very simple explanation, and some might kind of disagree with this a little bit, but Latino tends to be a broader, kind of more encompassing terminology that refers to anybody from Latin America, anything south, basically, of the United States, um, sometimes falls under the broad umbrella of Latino, even though Latino, Latina, although not everybody really identifies that way. Um, Hispanic is more uh, kind of specific in a sense, that it refers to um, places that were traditionally colonized under Spain. So Spanish-speaking countries uh, like um, Mexico, um, through most of Central America, uh, Cuba, some of the other countries um, that are that are Castilian Spanish speaking, traditionally Spanish speaking countries. Um, in Latin America, there's a lot of countries that are Portuguese speaking and were colonized by other European countries. So, um, when we talk about Mexican American students, generally speaking, the term Hispanic fits, but again. Latino would also sometimes be used to refer to Mexican students. Chicano was kind of a more broad kind of movement that started in the 60s to incorporate the indigenous people of that area. And then uh, Latinx is kind of a new term uh, that's more kind of gender, gender neutral. Right, so I kind of mentioned in my introduction that I um, had lived in, in New Mexico for a period of time, both in Albuquerque and Las Cruces. Um, this is a picture from Albuquerque uh, looking east to the mountains. Um, and this is Old Town Mesilla, where I lived I lived really nearby. And on the bottom right hand to the corner, sort of out of out of the, the picture, but there's a there was a jail there where Billy the Kid was captured and held for a period of time where he escaped from and right outside of town here is where he shot Pat Garrett and all that all that kind of history um, occurred here. So there was a church on one end, on the other end uh, is a bar. And I would visit um, Old Town Messiah quite often. And in the center there, the reason I mention this is in the center there's a gazebo, and that's where the Gadsden Purchase was signed. And the Gadsden Purchase kind of, a, in a sense, amended the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and it added additional um, land mass onto the United States. Um, so this is, this is the um, bar that sat at the end of the seat. Um, so here on this slide, you can see, basically, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the Mexican-American War. Um, the United States Army drove the Mexican Army back to Mex Mexico City. Uh, there was a um, you know, treaty signed to end the war. And as part of that, the United States annexed California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, um, New Mexico, major parts of Colorado, and Texas. And if you've been in this area, you know it's a huge landmass, um, and that's why today so many parts of that land have traditional Hispanic names, Los Angeles, San, San Bernardino, or in New Mexico, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. Um, the names of the roads, the, uh, you know, the land masses, the, the counties, are, are all sort of traditional um, Hispanic terminology or names. And so I really like to emphasize this because I think it's incredibly important for teachers to have this kind of awareness of Hispanic cultures being part of the United States because I think in today's political climate, it's, it's almost exclusively seen as something invasive, something foreign, um, something, you know, sort of outside of the United States. And um, sometimes there's a chant uh, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. 
that refers to this this history. Um, so that that's the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo that we annexed this big area of land. And as part of it, what we did, um, this picture was circulating a lot on social media. Um, Mexico would agree to pay for the border wall, but they wanted the, 19, the 1848 border, basically. So that's what the United States would look like today um, had it not been for the treaty. So uh, as part of that treaty, too, there were a lot of, you know, Hispanic people, traditionally formerly Mexican people who lived in that area who became U.S. citizens after the treaty was signed. And they were granted three, three particular rights. Um, the right to retain the Spanish language, the right to property ownership, and um, the rights of U.S. citizens. And that, that's important to remember. Those three rights were granted under the treaty. Um, the right to retain the use of Spanish, the uh, property rights, and the rights of um, U.S. citizens. And of course, all three of those rights were attacked um, after, after the treaty. All right, so another key point that I wanted you guys to know from the reading is the difference between additive and subtractive Americanization. Um, simply put, subtractive Americanization is the attempt to remove the idea that you have to remove all aspects of, of like Mexican culture or of someone's culture basically for them to assimilate into this country. Additive would be the, the idea that the two can coexist and and function fine alongside of each other. So those terms often get used to differentiate forms of bilingual education. So subtractive bilingual is you have to get rid of the Spanish language. Uh, additive would be the idea that you maintain the home language or, or um, you know original language, and then you you make the child genuinely bilingual. So um, and I'm going to apply those or talk about those specifically. In relation to three three different schools, so if if you're familiar with this region and you know the history, you know Catholicism is made you know ingrained sort of in in um, through Spanish colonization. So Catholic schools had an additive approach, and what I always like to emphasize here is as a result, uh, Catholic schools tended to be successful uh, in that area. Protestant schools took a subtractive approach. Um, again, they saw the you know, um, Mexican culture is being tied up in Catholicism. It was, you know, so, uh, and they were unsuccessful. Public schools started off as additive and then over a period of time became subtractive. And that's because initially they were uh, more locally based. They There were more local political control. Um, and the other thing that I would mention that, I'm, because we're going to pick up with this reading in, a, in um, you know, a week or so, uh, the, the sort of second part of the reading, so I always like to re like sort of point out too that different uh, states um, had really kind of like different approaches because of different factors, and I, I can just tell you again from living in New Mexico that there was a there's sort of still a kind of you know established Hispanic community, um, and so New Mexico generally speaking has had a more favorable relationship, and even there there's a lot of tension and problems and things, but at least somewhat more influenced by the, the Hispanic population. And as a result, schools have tended to do better, whereas um, Texas and California experienced far more uh, immigration and because of other factors in those states um, have traditionally at least had a, a more subtractive approach and um, major gaps and problems, which will come, come out through more in the reading uh, in a week. Um, the other thing I, want, I just want to mention really quickly that, that there's both there's two sides here that the authors are trying to point out. One is the the struggle dimension, the the experiences that Hispanics had in that, that area, and then also the they say the plight dimension, which is how people reacted and sort of fought back. Um, so and both of those are kind of somewhat important to kind of keep an eye on um, as you do the reading. Um, so traditionally, Hispanics have been seen as a as a cheap labor source, uh, and we're going to talk about this um, in in coming weeks. But oftentimes, tracked into programs for low level employment. Um, and then we know the, the local control. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over this. I, I have um, used examples of some of the more harsh kind of emerging anti-immigrant. 
um, policies that are affecting schools. Um, in Alabama, there was a law that, that tried to force teachers to uh, report people they thought were here illegally. It cre created a major backlash, um, and they amended the law. A similar law was proposed in Indiana. And then um, I also have been talking because it's, it's uh, in the media, you know, recently. But um, the president um, uh, rescinded the DACA uh, legislation, um, and um, DACA tends to be pretty popular when you explain it to people. Um, any child who was brought here, um, you know, who is here essentially illegally, but came here. Uh, when they were a child, um, you know, brought by a parent, so therefore, you know, wasn't really their decision, but ended up here um, and have been here with no criminal record, no problems, could apply for this deferred action for childhood arrivals, and it would have give it give it gave them some some basic abilities to just live and function, um, so that they could, you know, qualify sometimes for in-state tuition or they could get a job or work permit. Um, it kind of, in a sense, took them out of the shadows. Um, and they paid for this and had to renew every two years. Um, um, so I'll send you guys a, a video on that in case you're interested. Um, I should also mention that sometimes I have uh, extra credit questions related to the exam, and sometimes I use some of these contemporary issues as um, extra credit questions. Um, so the four different areas that I wanted to go over really quickly, um, I'll just mention that with school access, uh, this is a period of time where you get uh, segregated schooling and um, inequitable schooling. And school enrollment increases for all children through the you know this time period from the mid-1800s and into the 20th century. So the time we're talking about here into the 1930s, school enrollment rises for basically all kids. The reason for that is, um, you know, increasing um, uh, industrialization, and that means, um, you know, more people going into the workforce, uh, child labor laws, laws against child labor, and then mandatory attendance uh, laws. So all those things tend to increase. But the thing is, is that you have a growing gap between Anglo and Hispanic students through the 20th century. So uh, higher enrollment for Anglo students and then major gaps with um, Hispanic students. Um, in terms of quality of education, um, uh, Mexican American students uh, have, you know, access to segregated schools with lower quality, um, uh, more unprepared teachers, um, limited resources, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that kind of comes up in this section that we're going to talk more in depth about in the next section is um, sort of the, like, for example, the over-enrollment of students in special education of Mexican-American descent, um, labeled as mentally inferior, those kinds of things. Um, curriculum policies. I think the key thing that I wanted you guys to know here is they, they talk about the shift from the three R's to the three C's, and that's from a shift from reading, writing, arithmetic to um, command of the English tongue, uh, um, civics instruction, um, and um, so those those kind of three areas. The key thing to remember, though, is the shift from an academic curriculum to a uh, socialization, a focus on American and Americanization or socialization. Um, so that's kind of the key point they're trying to illustrate here. The Mexican American students, um, you know, didn't have the same access to a, a rigorous academic um, curriculum. And then in terms of school performance, um, there were major gaps between Hispanics and Anglo's that occurred um, that they kind of illustrate. Um, so so a, gro a growing gap, and then un under enrollment or high high dropout rates is one one of the things that they mentioned as sort of an example, um, low uh, post-secondary enrollment. Um, the, another kind of key point here, though, is that to remember that the authors point out that it, even though there were a lot of odds against Hispanic students, there, there wasn't 
it wasn't just all not all students did universally bad there were some students who in spite of obstacles did perform well in school and so they try to highlight that um and one of the you know they kind of point out we don't know a whole lot about them um and as a quick side note like the reason for that is because most of those students if they enrolled in college or went on to post-secondary school they just simply enrolled as white uh, at that time period because there's obviously some ambiguity or complexity around the idea of, of Hispanics being different, you know, racially um, from other kind of, you know, uh, European immigrants and stuff. So, um, so those are the four key areas. And again, I, I would kind of recommend maybe reading those over and, and looking at them a little more in depth. Um, so I, I think that's, um, those are the main things. The other thing that I would, you know, kind of point out is that Parents weren't just passive. They, they did um, protest uh, inferior schooling. Um, they did have walkouts and, um, as they called them, blowouts or protests. Um, they did challenge um, English-only laws in, in the court. So one of the things that came up in the, I think it was in the quality of education section, that, that this was a period where um, English-only laws were being promoted. And the Supreme Court has, has repealed or overturn those laws on the basis of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that we did grant the right to retain Spanish and also that the United States doesn't have a national language by law like some countries do. Obviously our language is English, but we don't have that inscribed in law in the same way that um, some do. So that kind of goes over the four areas. Um, I just, I'm not going to talk about this in depth right now. I just sometimes what I do is I introduce the issue of dropout rates. Um, uh, Shelbyville, Indiana, appeared on Time Magazine under the um, title "Dropout Nation," and they sort of profiled um, this town in Indiana um, to talk about the way sort of you know that somewhat quintessential small mid midwestern town still had a high level of students that didn't make it through school, and I think the mindset sort of in this time period. Um, that this came out was that, uh, um, you know, when kids are a problem in school, we need to get rid of them. Or if they're not taking the school seriously, we need to get rid of them. And that, the mindset has changed dramatically. I think people realize now the major economic impact that, that dropouts have um, on society. Um, they tend to consume a lot of resources, whereas somebody graduates and goes on, ends up contributing um, to society. So it's it's a major issue that's come up. And I think since the time of this article, we've managed to improve uh, the retention rates in schools, but there's still a disparity, and then especially a disparity when you look at, um, still today, Hispanic students. Um, the um, retention rates for African American students has increased, um, but there's just still some areas where there are um, disparities. And that's the problem with places like Indiana. Some schools and a number of districts have like 97, 98% graduation rates, you can go to IPS and some other districts that have, um, you know, 70, 80 um, percent. And then when you look at some other factors like expulsions and other things, it's it's pretty dramatic, a dramatic number of students sometimes who, who don't make it through. So, um, but I'll, I'll talk a little more in depth about that in a week when we kind of come back to this reading. So I hope, again, this is somewhat helpful. Um, and uh, if there's things I can do better, if, if you'd like me to go slower or articulate things a little bit more clearly, um, I would really appreciate that feedback. So thank you.